because his place was in Nuremberg. So Putin's place is in Hague, not in Bali. That's my, my personal view on that. So if we find anyone responsible for the, this really difficult situation for Indonesia, it's Russia and Russian president. Hundreds of people tortured with iron, with, you know, eyes picked and, uh, and tongues and everything. Women raped 20 times, 30 times by soldiers. Girls of six years old raped many, many times and died of this. Boys raped and killed. <laughs>destroyed all the plans of everyone. So uh, basically I don't have chance to go anywhere now because every day I should be here, including the, yesterday I gave the interview also to the media, even though it was San Sunday. Harilibur Juga. Oh, so busy. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, speak about the, uh, the hard situation in your country for uh, one month and two weeks. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, what has really happened in Ukraine today because of the invasion? Uh, the situation in Ukraine is very, very bad. However, not critical, but it's very bad and dangerous for many regions of Ukraine. After what we see in, uh, happened in uh, some small towns and villages uh, near Kiev, uh, I mean, the world knows now and can get the access to all the photos and videos from Bucha, from Irpin, from Borodyanka and everything. By the way, your colleague now in Kiev, mm -hmm. just arrived in Kiev, a journalist, uh, Vartavan, Indonesia. 
So today he went to these districts, mm -hmm. uh, like for, for making some reports. And tomorrow he goes to Borodyanka, another one. So after this, we all understand that whatever city is surrounded and maybe seized by Russian army will have the same, the same consequences. So if you just uh, civili civilians, uh, if you just stay there, live there, don't ever touch the weapons and everything, if you are a child or a woman, you are gravely endangered. So this is the main uh, concern of all the Ukrainians now, because any village Russian troops come in, they start killing, raping, murdering and torturing. So this is outrageous war crimes they commit every day. And uh, the other big concern is uh, humanitarian situation is rather grave, I would say, in some, some regions. And now the uh, cities of uh, Chernihiv and Sumy on the north of, uh, to the north from Kyiv are liberated. So we can see the results of, this, uh, of, this, uh, of these attacks. And the uh, uh, city of Kharkiv, second biggest, is again is a target. And, but the main, main, main humanitarian catastrophe is in Mariupol, in the south of uh, Ukraine, is a port which is surrounded for 35 days. Can you imagine 35 days people don't have electricity, food, water for drinking, even drinking water, heating, medicine. Mm -hmm. So many people just died because they don't have food or water, 35 days. So th this is what they do. It's, um, it's, uh, I'm speechless when I, when, I, when I start describing it. It cannot be understood. It cannot be accepted. Okay. And uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, uh, kept saying that Ukraine needs to be safe. From what? I think that uh, we need to be saved only from one uh, country, from Russia. Because uh, we've been trying to save ourselves and uh, to liberate ourselves from Russia for 300 years. It has been like a long story of uh, our uh, relations uh, through history. And uh, through these 350, three th th 350 years, <clears throat> it was the history of struggle for liberation, for struggle for liberty, struggle for independence from Ukraine, uh, of, of, of liberty of Ukraine from Russian mm -hmm. colonial rule. So um, now it's, I think it's very uh, important time for us. And uh, it's uh, crucial to put the final full stop to Russian colonial rule, really. We, we think this will be the final end of colonialism globally. So basically it's the war uh, of, of against colonialism. It's the war of uh, democracy standing up and fighting colonialism. It's very important to understand that. And uh, what Putin thinks, it's, it really doesn't matter now what he says and what he thinks, because what they say, including the diplomats and the media and everything, is uh, just direct lies, um, cannot be trusted. When people ask me, how can you identify where is truth, where is lies, where is propaganda? Uh, who is lying? I mean, we are telling the opposite same things, right? He's telling that we are getting liberated from whatever fascism, Nazis or whatever. Then you just take a close look at Russia. It is a fascist state. It is a terrorist state. It's all the characteristic features of fascist state. No, no, no much difference from Nazi Germany 80 years ago. So uh, uh, my answer is very simple. Look. <clears throat> You look at the country, free media, Ukraine, yes, Russia, no. Free access to the social media, like, uh, I don't know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, anything, even YouTube, TikTok, anything. Uh, Russia, no, Ukraine, yes. F freedom of speech, you can, you know, walk to the government or to someone else and just speak out what you think about what was going on. You can protest. Ukraine, yes, Russia, no. Uh, freedom of even the protest against war. You know that Russia passed the law, the law, the criminal law. If you say or write on the paper, no war or stop the war, without, without writing Russia or Ukraine, nothing, just no war, you'll be arrested and put into prison. So who is lying and who is telling the truth? It's uh, up to anyone to decide. So what is he trying to liberate us from? I mean after he bombed and shelled the big cities of Ukraine, many villages, after Russian soldiers tortured and killed hundreds of Ukrainians, 
I don't think that looks like liberation. I think that looks like genocide. I would not use this word like uh, uh, for sure, but it looks like very much like like genocide. Okay, but compare the Crimea in 2014, uh, Ukraine is small. Do you think Ukraine is more well uh, prepared in facing Russia's, Russia's military? Uh, <clears throat> Ukraine is definitely uh, was definitely b better prepared because we know the this neighbor is aggressive and this neighbor is uh, unpredictable. But the 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 bad thing was we really to the final minute we did not believe that he is not bluffing. We really hoped that this is just you know like threats and the pressure and uh, all that. And even if he invaded already. We still thought that this is just like a, like a war, right? Like uh, invasion, like you know, taking lands and uh, you know, occupying mm -hmm. territories, and uh, you know, uh, expecting people to greet him and set and something. After a few days, we understood. Basically, after two weeks, we understood that no, his purpose is not Ukrainian land. His purpose is not uh, even like occupation or that sort of things. His real purpose, I mean, he is Putin's and, and the state of Russia. The real purpose is really to destroy Ukrainian nation, finally destroy Ukrainian nation, erase Ukrainians from the life, from the world, and erase Ukraine as a free state from the maps. This is the final purpose and, and uh, final and uh, uh, ultimate purpose of Putin and Putin's Russia. Uh. And then, uh, do you see that uh, Russia's objective, this invasion, uh, are turning into failure? Uh, absolutely. Uh, this is this is uh, no doubts about this. Uh, in fact, interesting thing that uh, no one in the world believed that Ukraine will manage to resist more than a week. Everyone was uh, really thinking that in. Uh, uh, five days, three days, four days, maybe six days, uh, Kiev will be seized and uh, the uh, like first surrendered, then attacked, then seized. So no one except Ukrainians, except the president of Ukraine, because he was warned many times that this will happen. And uh, he was uh, invited many times to leave Ukraine, start to somewhere, just, you know, fled to to the West. Yeah. And uh, he refused. However, he could understand the consequences of that. But only Ukrainians believed in themselves, and this is obvious. I mean, people who uh, were still very badly armed. In fact, we didn't have any heavy weapons. We, di we were, you know, according to the statistics, very simple. Uh, Russian army is like about all the old Russian army. It's about 20,000 tanks. In Ukrainian army, it's about 900 tanks. It's, it's uh, uncomparable. It's a huge it's so huge difference. Same story about the uh, aircrafts, helicopters, about the armored vehicles, about the sh ship, about the, uh, you know, like war warships, uh, and about, especially about missiles. We, we didn't have all this. We were just, you know, and uh, first days it was really hard. But people, because people were highly motivated and still are, and they are defending the, the land, they are defending the, the people, children and, uh, and mothers and sisters. And... Uh, uh, friends, so uh, this motivation led to the defeat of Russian army on many directions, and uh, this will definitely lead to defeat or uh, to the Ru of the Russian army finally. And yes, uh, the, he failed to achieve the main goal: surrender and elimination of, of Ukrainians. So now he can still kill. He he he, cap he is capable still militarily to bomb the cities, to drop bombs and to hit missiles and all that to the cities. And still he is capable of killing civilians, but it's uh, the final target missed. Okay, uh, talking about the, uh, the attack uh, from Russia, the eastern side of Ukraine become a center of attention now uh, mm -hmm. for this invasion. So, uh, is it true that uh, the Ukraine peoples in East felt more comfort if they are joining with Russia? Uh, <clears throat> people in the East, mm -hmm. traditionally, because I'm from the East, 
and my uh, m many relatives of, 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 of myself, my family, uh, still live in the eastern part, and many relatives still live in the occupied territory of Donbass. It's like like um, like cousins or something. So so there are many people who are like my relatives. So I know about the situation from the first hand. I visited this uh, region many times and when I was a small small child and then teenager. So I really, I understand really well what is going on there and what was happening there before, even the, before the invasion in 2014. So uh, in those times, post-Soviet times, in fact, there were a lot of people who were feeling like very deep, who were very like, uh, had a very deep feelings uh, towards Russia because they were speaking like Russian language. My native town, Dnipro, is speaking Russian language. And the hometown of President Zelensky, Kriveri, is also 100% Russian speaking city. And um, <clears throat> of course, these people had some sentiments towards Russia because they were watching Russian television, listening to the radio, listening to, to news. They were less crossing the border even without the permits or visas. I mean, there is no border, basically. So between the villages, here's Russia, here's Ukraine. Nothing. You just walk here, buy things, go there. It's like a transparent border. Right? It, it, it was like this. So people were feeling like very close and uh, they often visit each other and all that. So sentiments existed, honestly. And uh, the sentiments uh, decreased to from like, I would say from maybe 80% of supporting Russia uh, to maybe 30% after 2014. Because if you really feel like a friend, if you really uh, like, um, uh, if you uh, present yourself like a neighbor, good neighbor, like protector and all that stuff, you don't kill people. You don't invade. You don't use the missiles to hit onto the villages and cities. And uh, the great, uh, the, the very obvious uh, uh, confirmation of my words, the very obvious uh, um, support for my words is the fact that when Russia attacked in 2014, <clears throat> I think it's like 1.5 million people fled from Donbass. And the, these were not Ukrainian speaking people. These were people who really like, like were pretty good towards Russia. So they fled, they, they ran away, they left the houses, they left the, everything, just ran because uh, they understood what is Russian world, Russian peace means. Uh, and uh, this is the main, like, like I mean, it's very obvious now. Yeah. So if uh, they feel close and uh, and like like relatives, they would never run away. Yeah. So after the last attack in February, uh, now I I think I don't know the statistics really because we don't have this uh, like mechanism of uh, of this social uh, social inquiries and all that public inquiries, but. I think that it is like 99% of people not just don't trust Russia, they hate Russia. They're furious towards Russia, towards Russian uh, army, towards Russian government, and also towards Russian people, because the people are supporting, still supporting Putin. They've shown the photos of Bucha, they've shown the videos, and they say what? Yes, it's right. Kill the fascists in Ukraine. Just kill them all. This Russian people, just citizens walking in the streets of many cities. I mean, like 1% maybe say something, oh, it's terrible. But majority say, right, we support Putin. And uh, the fact that during these 40, 46 days, the rating rate of support of Putin increased from like 67 to 82. What it means? It means that they hate us. They don't want us to be alive. Simple. So not now uh, we are not even thinking about like what alliance with Russia or about forgiving Russia or about like getting friendly with Russia. Anything, nothing like this never existed. He destroyed this totally. Okay, uh, we move to the NATO. Uh, so President Zelensky said no, uh, not interested anymore to join the pack. So uh, what happened exactly? Mm -hmm. And has Ukraine really give up joining the PAC or is still hoping to join them? NATO. Huh? NATO. Uh, I don't think it is a correct information that Zel President Zelensky said that we are not interested. No, it was not like this. He said, if uh, NATO doesn't want us, mm -hmm. we can do without. 
it's not a, I mean, we cannot force NATO to accept us. Cannot. But if NATO doesn't want us, what should we do? We should first, we should have the uh, guarantees of security. We should have very strong security guarantees provided by states who are willing to do so. First of all, our partners, like United States, United Kingdom, Poland, Canada, maybe, maybe Japan, maybe someone else. <clears throat> Second is, it's not so simple to uh, say that we are not going to join NATO because it's in our constitution. Mm -hmm. You understand what is constitution if it is to be changed. First step is referendum. All people should vote for like neutrality or something. Then it goes to the parliament for approval. So we pass the law, we change the constitution. Then the president signs it, the decree, and then constitution is changed and we are neutral. But this is a process that takes place in any democratic country. We, we are not like Russia, like Putin says something, oh, constitution is changed the next day. No, it doesn't work like this here. So uh, telling, can we be neutral? Yes, we can. Can we change this in one day? No, we cannot. Uh, will not accept us? I don't think, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. Recently, I read somewhere in the newspaper, I don't, I, I don't know to say, it's, it's like a general from uh, American Army. <clears throat> and he said that, what if we accept, for example, let's imagine we're going to accept Ukraine, right? First thing is about NATO standards. Now he said, Ukrainian army proved that the, uh, the, the Ukrainian army, uh, standards of Ukrainian army are higher now than the NATO standards. In all meanings, we are fighting, we are getting like, uh, like very efficient use of weapons, etc., etc. Standards, no problem. Political, political side is more complicated. Uh, political side, maybe, I think maybe uh, directly uh, refers to the fear of the West of nuclear weapons. That's of Russia. Yeah, that's something the, he threatens everyone to the left and to the right, that wh whoever supports will strike i mean this is this is outrageous i would say uh, so president zelensky said that the war could go beyond ukraine and spreads to europe uh, could give you comment on this yeah absolutely agree with this and not only to europe uh, i repeat again this is the last attack of colonialism onto democracy it's a global thing it's not like <clears throat> why i'm telling is global First of all, that uh, our world is, uh, is very small now. It's not like 200 years ago, small. Something happens here, it immediately influences something or so something and someone on the other end of the world, like food security, energy security, logistics, the everything, right? So in this meaning, uh, the influence on the world is huge and uh, it already influenced a lot of countries, including Indonesia, including China, including Africa, and in India, many, many, many places. As for the war, can it be, well, <clears throat> it is something, I'm not like uh, Ratu Juyo Boyo, I'm not prophet, right? So I cannot say if anything happens, what would come next? But looking at the uh, aggressive uh, stance, aggressive rhetorics of Putin, it is, I don't have any doubts that he would attack Finland, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia. That's why they understand this very, very clearly. That's why they help us so, so much and support. They understand that it is crucial to support Ukraine. So uh, what do you think the uh, help for your uh, neighbor country is uh, enough for <coughs> Ukraine to... Uh, facing the uh, invasion? At present, I think that uh, it's enough to carry on, to resist, but it's not enough to defeat, really seriously defeat, because uh, I, I just, I gave you the figure, right? Uh, as for the aviation, I think we have like, I don't know what many, eight, maybe 80 aircrafts compared to 800 aircrafts of Russia. So it's uncomparable. It's uh, too different, too, too, too far too. Uh, far too um, far too big, uh, this army is. Uh, they say it's like what second strongest army in the world, uh, like this. Not many countries really believed. I mean, nobody believed that we will be able to resist for so long. 
many people think that it will be the uh, uh, scenario in, of Afghanistan. They just drop off weapons and run. But from the very first days of the war, uh, we already, uh, well, well, the West, the partners started provided us with many excellent things. First of all is uh, like financial support and uh, humanitarian support, humanitarian aid, because uh, all logistic chains were broken and all that. And uh, the small arms, small weapons, like Javelin or like Stinger, all those are small for guerrilla wars mainly, but uh, still it's, it's very, very efficient, proved itself like really good stuff. And what is very important, sanctions. So yes, they are supporting us a lot. Okay, uh, so uh, what strate uh, strategies uh, that uh, Ukraine does for fighting the, this uh, with Russia? Just, uh, oh, it's difficult to say what strategies. I'm not the military, right? And uh, 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 to be honest, my Minister of Defense doesn't report to me at all what happens or what the plans are. And it's right, because uh, they have the plans, they have what they do. But what I want to say is they are well informed, they are well prepared, they are knowing the tactics and strategy of the, of the Russian army. They understand what they are capable of because of the intelligence and all that. So I think, well, <clears throat> the, final, the final purpose is very, very simple, to defeat the Russian army and make them surrender. And uh, make them, uh, you know, we, 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 are, we are looking forward to capitulation of uh, Russian army. Uh, but uh, talk about the uh, help from your uh, neighbor country. Mm. So uh, civilians, many civilians are killed because of yes. the invasion. So uh, how about the... What can I say? Uh, how about the peace negotiations? You know, uh, after, again, I repeat, after Borodyanka, after uh, uh, Bucha, uh, after Mariupol, I do not believe that Russians want to negotiate. They don't want to negotiate. Because if you have peace negotiations, key word is peace negotiations. Key word is peace. You cannot uh, sit down on this table and talk about peace at the same time, killing civilians in cold blood in cities and villages, rob robbing the houses and shelling Mariupol and Kharkiv with missiles. It's no peace negotiations. So we never refused of, of negotiations. But the, it's uh, like, uh, I think it's obvious for even for a child that if you want to negotiate, first of all, what you do, cease fire, just stop fighting. And then you sit down and talk. And if nothing, well, they go on. But it, during this process, it's uh, crucial. It's only one demand from Ukrainian side. We want you first stop shelling, stop killing, stop bombing. And then we sit down and talk. But Russia never, never followed this rule. And I mean, it's just, what, five rounds of negotiation, then, then St Istanbul, then it's like ridiculous. It's very understandable why. Very understandable. It's so clear to me that, you know, like crystal clear to me. Why? I repeat first, the purpose is to eliminate Ukraine, not to, you know, liberate or protect or something. Second one is now Putin in Russia, because Russia is a closed country informationally, so they nearly don't have any access to any information unless they dig deeper a bit into the internet and everything. But on the surface, TV and all that stuff, like, it's, it's, it's lies and they are isolated. So, uh, how about you say that about the uh, Bucha and the other uh, cities? So, what happened in, in there? What is the situation? <clears throat> the situation was uh, unimaginable. We, we, we knew that something bad is going on, but we could not imagine the scale and the methods of uh, what they did. Basically, I, I, I have PhD in history, world history, so I did some digging into the history, like deep, deep in there. I mean, that scale of uh, murders and the uh, ways they uh, did it, I think last time it was perhaps, again, by Russians during the Second World War in Berlin, and again by Russians during the First World War in this revolution in 1918, 1920, again in Ukraine. So that's what they did. Uh, what they did is is uh, is uh, <clears throat> cannot be 
I cannot just talk about this like uh, simply because when I when I look at it, I just cannot cannot imagine that this is really uh, happened. Hundreds of people just killed, not killed in action or maybe like tank. Tank is going along the street, and it turns and fights into the building, into the residential. No army, just you know residential flat. <clears throat> Hundreds of people tortured with iron, with, you know, eyes picked and, uh, and tongues and everything. And then hands tied on the back and they shot into the head after all these tortures. Women raped 20 times, 30 times by soldiers. And these soldiers is not like during not Second World War in Nazi Germany, like these special SS uh, troops which were like, you know, uh, crazy guys. These are the 22 years old of Russia, just boys, mm -hmm. and they do this. Girls of six years old raped many, many times and died of this. Boys raped and killed. This is what happened there. And these are just, what you see on the video is like 10% of what is really there because people just could not film this. Because of the uh, Bucha uh, situations, uh, Russia faced the anger of the international community and then they decided to back off from the UN Human Rights Council. What do you think about this? Absolutely support, but uh, I mean, uh, after this, after Bucha, not only this happened, uh, many things happened. Uh, sanctions were imposed, uh, more sanctions were imposed on Russia and on the personalities and even on the families of some personalities, including Putin's family. Um, very severe sanctions against many things. More companies left Russia, more, uh, more uh, uh, boycott uh, movements started against Russia. And uh, after this, really, Ukraine uh, was uh, like uh, given a green light to receive uh, good weapons in uh, in sub substantial quantities. I think I hope. So we have this green light. So uh, after they saw this, because this is massacre. This is massacre. That uh, I mean, you can remember from the history Nanking in uh, in in uh, in China during the 1938-39, uh, I think. You remember massacres the Germany's committed in, in uh, territory of uh, former Soviet Union and all these concentration camps, all these Auschwitz and the Buchenwald and all this stuff. This is the same story. This is the war crimes against humanity. So uh, this uh, like uh, gesture of uh, uh, within the UN, uh, Human Rights Council, uh, this is a, a very good sign that world community is doing the right thing. However, I would repeat again and again, United Nations now is toothless and uh, useless because the permanent member of Security Council with a veto right is an aggressor. So UN can, can speak a lot, can pass resolutions, but it ends up nowhere. It's dead end because of the Russia, because of the Security Council. So do you want uh, Russia to back off too uh, from the uh, UN Security Council and uh, as, a, as a permanent member? Interesting thing. Uh, of course, I, I think that after this war, the uh, one of the biggest issues would, I hope, right, that after this war, the biggest issue of the world uh, global politics will be expelling Russia from the Security Council and reform of Security Council, because it, it doesn't work, you know, at all. And uh, it might be a great reform or reforming of Security Council. I hope so. Uh, that's one. Second, interesting thing that, you know, our uh, lawyers, not only our lawyers, and uh, now, now, now raised this issue uh, a few months ago already. Russia actually has no legal right to be in the Security Council. It never joined the Security Council. It was never accepted in legal, normal manner. USSR, Soviet Union, was a member of Security Council, 
right? Then it split into 15 countries, yeah? And somehow Russia, who was just a part of the uh, Soviet Union, however the big part, but just a part, somehow just left there and uh, no documents, no voting, no, like nothing signed. It, it's just illegal for Russia to be the member of Security Council. And we already uh, uh, like uh, provided a lot of documents for that. So now the, it, it is being considered. It's not a quick process, but they really don't have right to be there for the first, for the first, uh, like for the beginning, yeah? And after this, yes, it's, uh, unfortunately we have this situation with UN and uh, uh, during the last eight years, can you imagine this? We had the war in Donbass. We had, we were really willing and, and wishing to have the peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers there and UN observers there. 11 times we applied, 11 times Russia rejected, 11 times in eight years. So you can understand what was going on in Donbass, in occupied Donbass. Okay. Uh, okay. The others, uh, Muteraza Forum, yeah. uh, like, uh, G20. Yes. So, uh, because of this invasion, uh, U.S. President uh, Joe Biden, Britain would not attend the G20 meeting in Bali. What do you think about this? And do you do you want uh, Ukraine also attending the uh, G20 summit in Bali? Because uh, Biden said that uh, if Indonesia uh, still invite. Uh, Russia, so invite uh, Ukraine too. Uh, you know, this is a very, like, a remote uh, topic for me. Why remote? Because uh, summit is to be held on in November, right? And it's still six months. We have the war for 46 days already, and half of Ukraine is destroyed. So many people died. So many changes in, in everything, in consciousness, in, in everything, right? The war crimes were disclosed, everything. And we still have six months to, before the summit. So many things can happen before this. So I would not predict what, was, what will happen, but I just can say all from myself what I think about this, about all this. First is that uh, this is very authoritative. I would say the most authoritative summit in the world. Most authoritative, more authoritative, at least than, for example, UN, because it uh, can decide, it can make uh, make decisions, it can implement decisions. So this is the group of the world leaders, the most powerful economists, and all that. So authoritative and respected summit. Can you imagine the war criminal, the man who started this cruel war against the neighboring country? Uh, blame of the thousands of deaths of Ukrainian civilians and tens of thousands of deaths of his own citizens on this war. A, a, a guilty of uh, war crimes can attend the summit of so respected people and leaders, world leaders. I cannot even imagine this. Just I, I cannot put it into my head because like like, can you imagine Hitler attending G20 after the Second World War? No one can imagine this. Because his place was in Nuremberg. So Putin's place is in Hague, not in Bali. That's my, my personal view on that. Uh, and uh, after, after, after all, you know, the impact of this war onto every goal on the agenda of G20 is so huge. You cannot just ignore it now. It's energy security, it's food security, it's peace and stability, it's uh, whatever transition, it's world health architecture, because not, not, now, now everything is, is, is just collapsed, all that, in this region. What COVID? No, nobody remembers what it is now in Ukraine and in, in Europe also, because the people are just, you know, messing around. So how can you, I mean, have a summit not taking into account the situation in Ukraine? and all the consequences and all the influences and all that stuff. So uh, that's another, another point. And the third point is, you see, I understand what, what, what many world leaders say, that if this guy goes 
I would not want to sit near him. So I would not come. So I think it would be like, I don't know, maybe, 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 maybe. It's not about inviting him or not inviting. It's about his attendance or not. You know, there are a few choices of, uh, a few scenarios of that. Maybe one scenario would mean G20 minus one. Another scenario could mean G20 minus 10, maybe. But maybe there is a good scenario, G20 minus one plus one. Ukraine. No, not necessarily. No, Ukraine will be like a, uh, like, a, I would love to see Ukraine like an observer, like a visitor, like a guest right, on this. I would love this. And uh, I'm sure that my president will go and attend like a guest, right? But I mean, minus one plus one. I mean, Russian economy now is deteriorating so fast. And uh, up to, to, to the time of the summit, maybe it's, it will be like a default state. So what economic influence can it have during the summit? Maybe we can think about another country replacing it in G20 to, to remain in G20, right? Maybe, I don't know what country, I just didn't calculate this, but there's a lot of countries uh, like uh, with dignity and proud nations and uh, peaceful nations that can replace, right? It's my fantasy, but it's, it's not my position of my state or something, but it's my fantasy, but I would love to, to see this, yeah. I don't think Russia even, it doesn't deserve to attend any authoritative and respected forum. But I think that even uh, in terms of economy, it would not have the, the share in these uh, uh, organizations. It will be like small and weak and default, you know. It's failed nation now, I think, failed state. But uh, because of that, uh, Indonesia trapped uh, in hard position as a president of G20 this year. Uh, yeah, you know, this is quite a disappointing uh, because Indonesia, this is the first time Indonesia as a chair. Uh, so uh, what is your response about this? What do you say to uh, the Indonesia government about uh, the, this? Your, your, your perspective about this G20 or something? Well, I'm not in the position to advise the Indonesian government. They are clever people and experienced people and uh, uh, politicians with great experience <coughs> in governance and all, all that, international relations. But I would just remind everyone in this world that it's not because of Ukraine, but because of Russia. This all happened. And the G20 summit and G20 agenda under threat because of one and single country, Russia. So if we want to do anything about it, the one to talk, the one to press, the one to push is Russia. It's nothing to do about United States or about European countries or other G20 members. Only one and only and unique. Just, you know, so it's, it's, it's not the, I, I, I think that, you know, the one you, you have to approach, talk, push, persuade, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe sanction, maybe limit, maybe boycott is Russia. So, I don't know. R Russia is always saying, telling that everyone that uh, it's uh, the Western countries to blame of everything uh, happening, bad happening in this world. Mm, it's uh, the, the right to speak so. I think they didn't have too much time left for, to, 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 to say so. But it is Russia who is to blame, who is guilty of all this stuff. So if we find anyone responsible for the, this really difficult situation for Indonesia, it's Russia and Russian president. Okay, Ambassador, I think it's enough to talk about the Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. So we move to the, uh, the relationships about the Indonesia and Ukraine. Absolutely. So, good. Uh, good idea. What do you think about the, is, is the situation of the in Ukraine now with the Russia uh, impact with Indonesia and uh, with uh, the relationship with Indonesia? No, there is no big impact in terms of direct relations, but uh, there is a uh, huge economic impact on Indonesian economy. Of course, on Ukrainian economy, yes, but on Indonesian economy, speaking about the bilaterals. Yeah. 
It's uh, really it's about the uh, Ukraine and Indonesia uh, relationships. You mean the diplomatic relationship? Yes. I don't think there is any influence. We're still the fr friendly countries, and uh, there are no no disputes on anything. Uh, I would expect more support from Indonesian government, more moral support. Definitely, I would expect this. I would hope that uh, Indonesian uh, government will be more firm in condemning the aggression, in condemning the war crimes committed by Russian Federation. Because you see, when, when you feel something is going wrong, something is not right, uh, I, I think it is important to make right accents, like strong accents, and name the aggressor and name the war criminal. This is uh, crucial in, in uh, making this aggressor stop. If we want to stop uh, Russia from, uh, from this war, if you want to end this war and uh, restore peace in Europe and in, in Ukraine, I think it is important to name the aggressor, name the war criminal, and to condemn it very directly. That, that's my hope. We really, we, I mean, we really support we're really looking forward for uh, strong support from Indonesia because um, on my point of view, I always thought that the, like G20, right? Uh, these are the most influential countries. And uh, every big country, not, not big country, but great country, right? The, or every leader of the, of the region or leader of the world. And Indonesia is turning into the global force, global leader now, one of the global leaders, right? Has not only the power to decide upon something, not only the right to like to advise or to um, shape up, to build up the uh, architecture of world, of uh, global economic, political, whatever else relations, but also have, has a duty to protect peace, stability, security and development. All big powers has this duty, I think, like I would say part of Indonesia, like India, like Brazil, like United States, like China, like Japan, like many. The, these are the key, key, uh, uh, key defenders of the world peace. Like Russia, by the way, as a security council. It should protect peace and security, not attack the neighbor. Yeah, so uh, this is basically my hopes. On, on this issue, but but uh, I, I don't think. I mean, I feel the support from real support from Indonesian people. I feel the real support from Indonesian media and uh, from the civil society. I get a lot of support. I got a lot of signals that we are supporting Ukraine and uh, we are against war. Everybody is telling this that uh, that uh, we are definitely. And uh, I mean, the Constitution of Indonesia says that. We, are not, we could not support any sort of war and all that. So it's, 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 it's uh, clear, right? But it's not enough. Just to say we are against war is not enough because, uh, like, uh, you know what? This neutral formula, stop the war and, uh, like, uh, we are against war, we are for peace, is used by Russian propaganda directly. As you may, 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 may feel, uh, as you may, may have read, Immediately after this statement of the President Jokowi on the situation in Ukraine, I think in Twitter, something like this, uh, next day, Russian ambassador in, in Indonesia uh, published a response to say, yes, I support, I absolutely agree with uh, His Excellency Pak Jokowi's view. We have to stop the war. We have to put the end of this war. But this should be addressed to Ukraine and the West. That's what she wrote. I mean, come on. This is, this is absolutely, you know, like, I think this is humiliation. This is uh, absolutely something she has no right to do, uh, to say like this. And then it's in her publication in Russia, what she said that, I'm grateful that Indonesian people widely support, Indonesian society or nation, I don't widely support the military operation and, this, and the politics of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. My God. Is it true? If it's not true, I think that someone has to say something about that. Because this is like, and Russian people say, oh yeah, we understand that Indonesia, we have full support of Indonesia. 
of government and of people and all that. That's, that's what they think now in Russia. So we do need moral support and we do need any other support. Any support is valuable for us and for the world peace and security. Too. Okay, and, and from the uh, Indo Indonesia now, uh, I think like uh, import with gandum mm -hmm. from, gandum. from Ukraine and because of the war, of course the it's in it's uh decreased like yeah uh so russia says that they are ready to supply to change uh ukraine to supply indonesia's uh needs about the wheat so what do you think about that <laughs> like a still your <laughs> market I it's think. uh uh well it's a uh, it, it sounds ridiculous because okay. i've been doing this for many years like uh, watching on the Uh, grain markets and everything. Uh, Ukraine is one of the main factors of the uh, main countries who ensure the uh, food global food security system. One of the main players there. And uh, it's not only about Indonesia, it's about China, it's about Africa, it's about Middle East, it's about Central Asia, it's about Europe. Finally. So it's a lot of things and uh, it's complicated, it's not that easy. First, Russia is not capable to produce that much of things that we produce in Ukraine because Russia doesn't export that much of everything. Uh, so it can replace, what, 60 million tons of everything produced in Ukraine annually? It's just ridiculous. It just doesn't, uh, cannot be uh, relied on. That's one. Second, how can anyone buy Russian, uh, like whatever it is, wheat or, or corn, How would they pay for it when uh, all the banking system of Russia is under sanctions and all the uh, foreign currencies are, for, are banned from, from changing or using in Russia? Uh, how would you pay for that? Or anyone? How would anyone pay for that? Third, I think it is from the point of view of ethics and uh, morality, I think that it, it, would, be, it would be good to boycott Russia's uh, trade uh, relations, to boycott Russia in trade at all, uh, and not like develop something with Russia. Uh, it, 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 will, it will come to the very bad consequences for Russia very soon. And uh, uh, I mean, even China like refused to do many businesses now with Russia, just refused to supply this, refused to buy this, refused to, because Payments and sanctions. So who would like to, to have this, uh, you know, business? And as for the uh, influence, it, I'm really telling you that uh, uh, first, if we don't, if we fail to uh, gather crops in summer, in autumn, it will be very bad. It will be, it will be, it will be disaster for many countries in terms of food security. And by the way, as an example, Now we have 95 vessels full of all the commodities, mainly grain and oil and all that. I mean, oil, like uh, minyak, uh, makan, uh, food oil, uh, blocked in the Black Sea. 95, nearly 100 vessels full of grains, full of everything. Maybe some of them should go to Indonesia, I don't know, but 95, because Russia blocked them, just doesn't let them leave Odessa port. And the in Sea of Azov near Mariupol, it was again one big port. Five or six or seven, I don't remember how many big vessels full of grains were stolen by Russians, just took away somewhere, I don't know where. And uh, that might be also something belong to Indonesia. So again, someone who should be addressed, someone who should be boycotted, pushed and, you know, uh, talked to at least, by the world community is Putin, is Russia, yeah? Okay, so the last question for me, okay. Ambassador, uh, Excellencies, uh, what do you, what do you uh, want, what Ukraine want to, uh, to do in the future with Indonesia? What, uh, like, uh, uh, what, what uh, relationships do you want to strengthen with Indonesia? Oh, this in is, the future? Good. Well, this is a good question. I mean, we are ready to, Uh, develop all the relations with Indonesia, definitely, on all directions, including, of course, the uh, political. 
uh, I think that uh, very important political and humanitarian, like that sort of uh, combined. I think that we have to introduce each other to to to, to our two people, two countries. Uh, I would say that in Ukraine, not many people are well aware of Indonesia, and I mean this is there will be a great job to do. And by the way, my good friend Pak Yudi Krisnandi, His Excellency, he did a lot during his uh, stay in Ukraine. He did so much. And uh, uh, he's my teacher now in this in this uh, direction. So I would like to do more, try to do more, or at least not least le less than him. And uh, we will develop this. We'll develop human uh, um, exchanges. We we'll develop uh, definitely tourism and uh, uh, education. This is important. You know, in Ukraine, before the war, there were thirty thousand of Indian students only. And in total, it's like 100,000 of foreign students studying in Ukraine. And Indonesian students, just, uh, just a little bit. Just. So we do hope that we will open this uh, these, uh, direction for I Indonesian students too. They have very good edu education and very reasonable prices. Of course, the trade and economy is uh, a direction, is a real field of, uh, of potential. I mean, we have huge potential. and. Uh, in many directions, we just didn't know what to do. We didn't know it exists. We didn't know you are interested in something we have, and we are interested in something you have. So this will be developed definitely in terms of high tech and all that, and investments, of course, and uh, the processing, the, I mean, the, we're, the businesses with uh, high added value are preferable, of course. So we will talk on this. I mean, we can do extraordinary things in uh, like, even military and technical cooperation, we can do a lot of things. But it will depend on when the war is over and uh, it will depend on how, uh, how fast would we be able to rebuild the uh, main economic fields, main economic branches, which were damaged, some, th some of them. So um, definitely the cultural exchange and humanitarian exchange will be a good direction, including the pharmaceuticals, including the uh, agrarian business too, in this, in this, including the, uh, like, I would really fancy to make a good project on uh, filmmaking, on making joint film projects. That will be great. That will be great. We have so much in common in our countries, really. And uh, we have, uh, let, uh, for example, just one thing, 1945, 1946, 1947, 48, 49, this period, Ukraine was the first who raised the voice in the United Nations in favor of Indonesia to be accepted by the UN. And it fought, our delegation fought for five years, four years, right, to make this uh, a reality, right? This is a good example for a nice film. Then liberation war in Ukraine in 40s, Liberation War of Indonesia at the same time. Uh, it's, it's amazing. We, we have too, too much in common. Even if we make the parallel, like parallel things like uh, from the history, nearly in the same time, uh, Majapahit Kingdom in Java kicked off Mongolian invaders, just defeated Mongolians, only one country in the world, as far as I'm not mistaken. And at the same time, Ukraine, however, did not defeat the Mongolians, but stopped them from invading Europe. So this was, was happening at the same time. Same glorious history and many, many things in common. Even our, even our, uh, even our anthems, they have a lot in, in, in common. Like uh, you have, you say, Bangunlah jiwanya, Bangunlah badanya untuk Indonesia raya, right? We, say, we sing in our anthem that we will sacrifice our souls, we will sacrifice our bodies for the freedom of our country. It's, it's nearly the same, like about Merdeka and uh, a lot of things. I think we, we have a lot to do in this. And uh, I'm, I'm really a fan of uh, cultural projects, but, but I think we have to start from information, from, uh, from uh, trade and, uh, yeah, and investments. But what do you think about the uh, Indonesian new, cap new capital city, Nusantara? So there, is there uh, any call? discussion about the cooperation there uh, no. or do you want to uh, maybe in Ukraine want to invest to the 
new capital city of Indonesia? I don't think we have the ability now to invest to anything. We have to we, we have to invest into rebuilding of our economy. But uh, it's uh, I mean it's it's uh, well I, I repeat I respect very much your government and uh, the wisdom they have, the experience they have, the support they have in the society and everything uh, will make them uh, will will. Uh, like ensure them to make right decisions. So new capital, wow, it's it's a widely a widely uh, spread experience. Many countries did, in in like in, in, on many continents. You can just say one, two, three, a lot. So mm, this uh, this is something I don't know what to say because if we if we are if we uh, are told that yes, Nusantara will be accomplished like by the year da 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 da. And uh, all the embassies will move onto there. Okay, we'll move. It's uh, gladly. It's okay. I, I've never been to Kalimantan, but I would love to. So I think it's uh, it's my private my private opinion. Okay, I think that moving the capital sometimes it's a very good uh, a good uh, uh, instrument, and I, I think that in, in the world practice it works like this. It uh, speeds up the development of other regions. It makes other regions develop independently and very rapidly. So this gives the impetus for other, other territories of the country to develop, to develop economy, culture, infrastructure, industry and all the rest. So it's my personal point of view. I think this is uh, this has always been a good idea for many countries. So why not here? I mean, it's, yeah. Jakarta is huge. And uh, why, well, uh, I mean, China did plan to, did, to do something like this because uh, Beijing is too, you know, overloaded with uh, traffic. Let's say Kemachetan, La Lulintas, and uh, it's smoke and uh, it's uh, like, uh, like, uh, like air is polluted yeah. and all that. So they decided just to move the industries away and then to move the businesses away. And then only like uh, what? Only like uh, uh, ministries, parliament left. And it's clean and neat and good. And just, you know, remaining the spiritual culture, uh, spiritual center, remaining the what? The capital, the cultural center and everything. But all the practical things moved away. Might be a good idea, too. Okay. And I like I think, the I like uh, the name Nusantara, really. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, I think this is that's enough for uh from us. So thank you so much for your uh, for giving us the opportunity. So uh we hope the peace Prevail. will be inshallah. Perfect. Yeah, saya mau saya ingin mengucapkan terima kasih banyak untuk kesempatan ini. Thank you so much. Really, it's uh, great to to have. I mean, what do you do, really? I I I I, I so appreciate because this is a, a uh, opportunity to tell the proud people of proud country the truth. This is important. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah. Ya, demikian Newsmaker Pekan ini. Kita akan berjumpa pekan depan dengan topik dan narasumber menarik lainnya. Saya Alfa Mandalika pamit. Sampai jumpa. Medcom.id, a part of Media Group Network.